Well, thanks very much, Alistair. Um, and uh, thank you to all of you for taking the time to come out on a, a, a very rainy uh, Melbourne evening. Um, and I just want to start by thanking the Institute as well for um, being prepared to uh, talk about what I think is a very important issue and is an area of Myanmar studies that's uh, been neglected for a long time. Um, but I want to, I want to start by taking you away from rainy Melbourne in uh, 2015, and I want you to think about what it would be like if you were in Rangoon in the mid 1880s, and what you might experience as you step off the boat at the harbour. So you've you've come through the Bay of Bengal, you've arrived at Rangoon, which probably you would have noticed the smell before you noticed anything else, because it's a, a, a unique place. Um, and as you walk with some trepidation down the gangplank, you notice, first of all, that it's uh, startlingly hot. Uh, if, if you were a man, you'd no doubt be wearing a suit and jacket, and it would be stiflingly hot. You'd, I'd say by the time you arrived, uh, have taken the time to have a couple of, uh, a couple of gin and tonics, uh, just for the quinine, to keep the, uh, to keep the malaria at bay. And as you step off the gangplank, the first thing you're, you're likely to notice is the red stained ground in front of you. Not red because it's the colour of the dirt, but red because it's uh, what happens when people chew the acra nut, the beetle nut. And, and spit on the ground. It's uh, it, it's uh, some people say it's uh, you know like Burmese cigarettes. They chew the beetle. But it's a little bit different to that. But would have been entirely unusual for uh, <coughs> for people travelling from um, somewhere like um, Australia or or from uh, or from Europe. You'd notice that uh, the Burmese men are dressed much more sensibly than you are. They're wearing longis. They're wearing the Burmese uh, male. Um, sarong, it's a, it's a kind of skirt that they, they wrap around and tie with either a front or a side, uh, or a side knot. And you'd notice, uh, you'd notice women carrying fruit and vegetables in trays on their heads. It's a, a, an interesting place to arrive. But probably the thing that would strike you most is when you looked into the distance and saw the golden spire of the Shwedagong Pagoda, one of the most uh, significant uh, Buddhist uh, uh, temples in Southeast Asia, and is a, a startling sight, even in you know our modern, slightly jaded times. It would have been an amazing sight in the 1880s. And if you were Rudyard Kipling, uh, who did exactly this in the mid 1880s, you'd you'd write something like this. You'd say, "This is Burma." And it will be quite unlike any land that one knows about. And the interesting thing for us in modern times is that many people in our society don't know very much about Burma. Uh, lay people in a country like Australia, if you're lucky, might know three things. They'll know something about Aung San Suu Kyi. They'll know maybe that she won a Nobel Prize. They'll know maybe that she was in prison. They'll know something about the controversy about the country's name. Is it Burma or is it Myanmar? And I'm going to, with, with some sort of unfortunate lapses, I'm sure, I'm going to stick with Myanmar uh, for uh, a whole range of practical reasons. Uh, but there are many people in that country and outside of it and connected with it who feel very strongly about issues of naming. And names of things and of the country take on hugely significant and highly political roles in Myanmar. And you know, way beyond what you might expect in a country like Australia. Uh, people have very strong views on these things. But nowadays, uh, people here might know a third thing about Myanmar. They might also know that there's a situation, and not a very good one, involving uh, a Muslim group called the Rohingya. And 
what they're likely to know about the Rohingya is something like this. They're likely to see the Rohingya in images on television uh, and in their newspapers as desperate, wretched, hopeless, very keen to get away from, uh, from life in Myanmar. They're likely to know that they've seen them on TV uh, adrift and unwanted in the Bay of Bengal. If you do a Google search of uh, Rohingya, you, you'll find that the images present you with a number of choices under uh, Rohingya. Rohingya map is the first one, and it's a migration map. The second subheading is Rohingya genocide, followed by people, boat, refugees, and the sixth, the sixth uh, category is Rohingya Burmese people. And this gives some indication of the situation that the Rohingya today, uh, in fact, find themselves in. Their situation is, uh, in, in fact, desperate. They're without Myanmar citizenship, and as a result, they're without the rights of citizenship that uh, would accompany it. They're, they're limited in terms of their civil, political, and economic rights. The law in Myanmar adds uh, to layers of existing discriminatory government policies against the Rohingya. There's restrictions on their ability to travel, not just their ability to leave Myanmar, but their ability to travel to the next community, to the next village, is restricted and requires permission. Their ability to marry without official government permission is not about filling in a form and it's accepted sometime later. They must seek mission that is highly likely not to be granted to them. Uh, pregnancy outside of marriage is illegal for the Rohingya. Uh, and more or less, their ability to undertake any, acti any economic activity is uh, 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 highly restricted. The subject to, to um, something that many other minority groups in Myanmar are subject to, uh, and that's forced labour. Uh, Penny Green uh, in fact, sorry, not Penny Green, uh, Chris Lua, who has studied uh, the situation of Rohingya uh, boat people from uh, Myanmar, describes the place where they live in northern Rakhine state of Myanmar as resembling an open prison. And the obvious question, I think, for us is, why is this the case? Why is it that, firstly, there is a, a large-ish group of Muslim people living as a minority within a majority Buddhist Myanmar? And the answer, I think, to that question requires a little bit of context. Uh, it's usual uh, looking at uh, Myanmar to uh, provide context, uh, often blame, by going to British colonialism or the 1962 military coup or looking for some answers in the 1988 uh, democracy uprising. But, and, and you know, being Irish born, it, 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 it wounds me to say, in fact, we need to go back well before the British arrived to provide some context here. Um, why is there uh, a Muslim minority in majority uh, Buddhist Myanmar? Well, uh, these maps, I think, will, or this map, will give you some indication. We all too often consider, particularly when we're studying, we consider things to be part of Southeast Asia or to be part of South Asia. And uh, I think we, we often ignore uh, a geographic reality, which is uh, that uh, there is uh, an immediate proximity of, this is Rakhine State, uh, and this is northern Rakhine state where uh, the uh, Rohingya are now forced to live in this, this northern section. But you can see the immediate proximity to uh, Bangladesh and India. This is, uh, this, this is an area that we consider now part of Southeast Asia, but it, it, it abuts uh, South Asia, which I think immediately gives you some answers as to why there might be people who look different to other people in that area. 
why there are people with different skin tones in that area. Uh, Professor Arlo Griffiths gave a talk um, at uh, SOAS in, in London about the archaeological history of uh, th uh, this area just north of uh, the modern day Sitway. And he's, uh, he speaks and reads the old languages and has, has managed to discern um, a, a sort of a very a first century uh, 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 sort of Hindu culture uh, present in that area. And it would be highly controversial to, to announce that within Myanmar. And it would probably by many people in Rakhine State not be accepted as true that there might have been sort of Indian influence or Hindu influence in, um, in, their, uh, in their community. But you can see, and you can, with, with some intuition, you can see that it would be highly reasonable that there would be people from what is modern day India or Bangladesh that would have 2,000 years ago or 1,500 years ago or 1,000 years ago travelled to this area that we now delineate as part of, uh, of Myanmar. Uh, the other interesting thing is that um, Rakhine State, it's, it's also known as Arakan. So Arakan is the old kingdom that used to exist uh, on um, sim similar but not exactly the same borders. Um, there's, there's a mountain range that runs sort of through here that prevented uh, prevented the Burmese from um, uh, from annexing Arakan for for quite some time. Uh, the, the Arakanese kingdom was made up of people who were uh, Buddhist. It was made up of people who were uh, also Muslim, but it was very much a product of its time. So don't, for an instant, consider that it was a benign and liberal um, uh, polity. This was a, a, a kingdom that, that uh, ha had its roots in the fourth century and you know, made its money in the ways that every other kingdom in that region made its money. It, it, um, it, it, it sold agricultural products and it sold human capital, people, slaves, and it acquired slaves. And the Arakanese did deals with um, the uh, Portuguese, uh, colonial Portuguese, colonial uh, Dutch, and I mean, straight out of uh, a Joseph Conrad story in terms of what was happening in that part of the world. The Arakanese uh, managed at one stage to uh, control this area, uh, Chittagong, uh, part of Bangladesh and to terrorise this delta just just here uh, in terms of turning up on the, with their boats and taking people as slaves. So lots of people get brought back to um, their capital, which wasn't then Sitwe, it was slightly further north, just there, called um, Mrao, um, which uh, has got some wonderful temples um, that are still in you know, reasonably good shape, you can see, but there's an old palace that's in some state of, of disrepair. But a, a, an amazing, um, an amazing history in a sense, because it's it's almost almost a, um, a, a forgotten history. And part of the reason was that tourists weren't weren't able to get into that area until very recently. It was incredibly difficult for um, for tourists to uh, travel there. So what happened to the Arakanese kingdom? Populated by um, both the, some people that we would consider the modern-day Rohingya, and to another Buddhist group called the Rakhine, who are ethnically not the same as the majority of Myanmar's Burma Buddhists. Um, well, uh, they were invaded by uh, by the Burmese in 1874-75. Uh, 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 sorry, 1784-85. Uh, the Burmese uh, invaded uh, and effectively annexed Arakan. They also uh, they also were getting uh, they're also quite active in Assam and Manipur, which are now states of India, and caused quite considerable concern for the British. And here's where things I think become very modern in terms of current activities within Myanmar. It wasn't the British government that they annoyed. 
it wasn't anything like that. It was the, the British East India Company who had commercial interests in Manipur and Assam and were very unhappy that the Burmese, who've now annexed Arakan and are creating other difficulties for them along uh, the border with, um, with India, modern day India, um, but the Burmese had very close links with the French at this time. And this created a commercial concern for the British. Uh, I, I won't go into the precise details of what occurred. There were three wars that began uh, before uh, the Crown took responsibility for India, but ended um, after that. So there was uh, an annexation by the British of, uh, of Myanmar, of then Burma, that started uh, with the first war in 1824, where the British took this area and an area over here that sort of um, continues down here along the, um, along the Thai border. Uh, the second war involved the British then moving into the area that we sort of know now as Rangoon. And the third was when the old royal palace at Mandalay was, um, uh, was ransacked. Uh, the Burmese lost uh, their king. It's the last time the Burmese had a king. And uh, Myanmar, Burma, uh, became a British territory controlled from Calcutta. And it's in this that the roots of the current problem not quite began because they didn't begin then, but it's in this resentment that's 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 what we read about and that's what we hear within Myanmar as um, a, a concern that that's that they they place their concern for what happened to their society with the arrival of the British. But in actual fact, the preconditions for the concerns that they now have predated that um, by quite some time. So the British arrive. The Burma Buddhist Burmese are unhappy at what happened under British rule. The Rakhine Buddhist are unhappy with what was done to them by the Burmese who invaded, and then by the British who invaded again. So the Rakhine were invaded twice in the space of uh, two generations. They uh, are very unhappy about that. The British governed uh, Burma out of India, and as a result, there was uh, a privileging of people who were uh, knowledgeable of the bureaucracy in India. There was massive inflows of, of Indian migrants into, uh, into Burma at that time. And as a result, uh, what we have was a, uh, a change in the pecking order in society. Uh, British Indian administrators and others, and the Burmese and Rakhine at the bottom. Both groups felt that they were now no longer in control of their own countries. The Burmese felt they'd been, that their world had been taken away from them. The Rakhine felt their world had been taken away from them twice. And they both look for someone to blame. Which leads us to the question of, um, so there's, there's a sense of there's blame and there's concern and someone's going to be uh, someone's going to be blamed, who's going to be blamed? Quite often in the history of, uh, uh, of uh, Burma or Myanmar, it's people of Indian descent. There was a deep resentment, still held today, uh, about both the role in the colonial pecking order and uh, an issue that will become an, a, a, a problem again in Myanmar which was the lack of access to capital for investment in farms and things like that. And it was money lenders from India that came to Burma to provide those loans. Uh, they were brutal in making sure that their loans were repaid or they would take your land or your, your property. Uh, as a result, um, the deep resentments towards um, people of Indian descent, people of Muslim descent, all of these things become a little bit conflated you know, when there's prejudice in society, difference becomes, you know, things get put together. And of course, uh, the group we now know as the Rohingya. The Rohingya's, um, the Rohingya's heritage, of course, is disputed. 
and uh, lots of groups claim, uh, lots of people within Myanmar claim that the Rohingya in fact only came to Myanmar after the British arrived. That this group of people we know as the Rohingya arrived with the British. But history shows us that there were people who were likely to be part of the current group of folk we know as the Rohingya that would have been in Arakan well before the Burmese arrived, that would have been in um, Burma well before the British arrived, and no doubt some people that arrived with the British. So this is what's given us these different narratives about history. The, the Rohingya narrative is we have lived here for thousands of years. We are the sons of the soil here. And some of that's true because it is the case for some. <clears throat> the Rakhine narrative, generally speaking, is that these folk arrived with the British. And more or less that's the same as the Myanmar government narrative, which is the group calling themselves the Rohingya arrived with the British. And there's huge controversy around the name Rohingya. Why is that the case? Well, it's very simply the case, and here's where we do blame the British. Um, the British undertook censuses census in, in Myanmar, and they collected data in a very 19th century way on ethnicity. They decided that this was something they needed to know. So they'd knock on the door, they'd say, what is your name and all the rest? and what is your ethnicity. And they fixed in stone something that had not necessarily been fixed in stone in that area. Ethnicity was much more fluid. People would change their ethnicity. Even, even now, in, in, in certain parts of that region, you'll, you'll meet people who will have many different ethnicities. What if your mother was, uh, your mother was Rohingya and your father was Rakhine? What's your ethnicity? Is your ethnicity Rakhine? Is it Rohingya? Is it something else? So the British collected this data, which has become the basis of citizenship in Myanmar. So Myanmar's 1947 constitution states how you become a citizen. And through, I won't go into the, to all the details, but the key document is the 1982 citizenship law. And it divides citizenship in a number of, number of, uh, number of ways. One of those ways is uh, if you're part of one of the big ethnic groups, Bama, um, are you Karen, are you Shan, are you Chin, Kachin, uh, Rakhine, or are you part of another list, which is a list of 135 ethnicities, which are sort of smaller ethnicities. And, and if you're on the list, if your ethnicity is on the list, you're a citizen or if you can show that you have heritage in Myanmar that goes back to before the British in, in 1823. The, the difficulty, of course, with the list is the list is determined by, it, it, it's, it's highly arbitrary, and it's determined by the Council of State. So by the cabinet, as they can put your name, you can put your ethnicity on the list, take your ethnicity off it. So of course, groups of people in Myanmar consider it really important to have an ethnicity, not just a religion or a residency. You have to, if you want to be a citizen, and you want protections of citizenship, you, they feel you must have an ethnicity. And this is where Rohingya came from, I, I believe. Now, there's all sorts of debates about how long the name Rohingya has been, been around. My, my view, and I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with my view on it, is that the name Rohingya was around, has been around for quite some time. Uh, I think it was clearly around when, when the British um, were uh, coming into Burma, but it was not the catch-all name for Muslims in, in the Rakhine area that it is today. The Constitution of 47 and then the 82 Citizenship Law have caused people concerned about their rights to claim an ethnicity and a unique ethnicity. Previously, I think Rohingya would have known, would have called themselves um, Arakanese Muslim. The Burmese, the ethnic Burmese and the ethnic Rakhine, just to generalise, 
don't consider Rohingya to be a legitimate ethnicity. They consider the use of the name Rohingya to be proof that you're new because the name wasn't in common use before World War II. And this is where we have the current rationale for the Burmese government, or for the Myanmar government's uh, refusal to grant rights, citizenship rights, to people who call themselves Rohingya. Now you might immediately say, ah oh, yes, but if they've lived in the area for so long, they'll have, they'll have maybe the ability to show how long they've lived there. Well, you've got to remember that when you try and have a, try and have a baby, for instance, in Rakhine State, you need permission to travel to a hospital. Now, if you're a Rohingya, chances are you're not going to get that in time. And as a result, you have your child at home. So, so the birth certificate isn't provided immediately. When you try and seek a birth certificate later on, there's no proof who the child really is or where the child was born. And this leads to a situation where plausibly administrators can say these are not legitimate residents of Myanmar and not entitled to citizenship. So it's a combination of law, uh, administrative uh, issues with the government, and the administrative the administration of the government of uh, of Rakhine State is is um, uh, you know it's 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 not pro Rohingya by any stretch of the imagination. So why do we know all about this in 2015? Well, in 2012 there was um, a uh, an outbreak of violence in Rakhine State, sparked by uh, a dreadful um, assault. Yeah by some Buddhist men of a, uh, some Muslim men of a Buddhist woman. And word of this spread through the community and the reaction was a pogrom uh, in Sitwe, which is the, uh, I'll just go back if I can, to Sitwe, which is the largest, uh, the largest town in Rakhine State where um, many Rohingya formerly lived. And I'll, I'll show you some, some images. This is the uh, this is the Jama Mosque, which is on the main street of uh, of Sitwe. And if you you find a lonely planet, I think from a couple of years ago now, you'll actually see it's one of the sites of Sitwe. There aren't many sites in Sitwe that Lonely Planet talks about, but the Jama Mosque is one. Uh, it's been utterly ransacked. The, these, of course, were people's homes. Uh, this, this area was the same. This is central. Uh, th this is central Sitwe. These were where, uh, so where, where the buildings are standing, uh, more or less uh, where uh, Rohingya and Buddhist residents lived side by side, where the buildings uh, have been uh, burnt out, that's where they weren't living, side by side. Now there was violence on both sides, there's no doubt about that, but the overwhelming uh, losers were um, the Rohingya and were Muslims. Uh, there are, as a result, 140,000 internally displaced people in Rakhine State. It's a very poor part of the world. It's, it's hard to eke out a living at the best of times, let alone when your home uh, and those of your friends and family uh, now, look, now look like that. Uh, there's two, two reports, if you want some more details on exactly what happened, there's two reports from Human Rights Watch that, that go into to detail. One, in fact, uh, uses satellite images to see the fires that were um, for quite some time not, not overly well reported because it was, it was just unsafe for journalists to in fact be there. Uh, this is uh, a, um, I mean I call it a, a, a pogrom. Uh, the Economist I think has described it as, as the beginnings of an ethnic cleansing. Uh, others call it a genocide. Um, it, it's it's certainly um, bits of all of those things uh, deeply concerning it's, it's uh, the situation um, and this is 2015 and there's still 140,000 IDPs in Rakhine State. Uh, the violence also spread to other parts of Myanmar so there were, there were sort of outbreaks of violence in other places too um, but the worst was in um, uh, was in Sitwe. So this I want to take us into 2015. I'm just conscious of time, so maybe just um, another five minutes. I really don't know if you want to be. So this takes us into 2015. And why is it that we see uh, pictures of Rohingya boat people, and, and undoubtedly some 
Bangladeshi, um, what we call economic migrants, but not Rohingya migrants on boats too. So the boats weren't exclusively Rohingya. Um, why are we seeing them on TV this year? Why didn't we see them two years ago? Well, what happened this year was that the United States uh, pressured Thailand to improve its performance on migration. The uh, US State Department had concerns about Thailand's uh, uh, performance. Thailand's, Thailand was level three, which is the lowest level of tra trafficking in persons report. The United States said um, to uh, the Thai government, uh, we would like that improved. And the Thai government, which is a military government currently, uh, took immediate steps to improve its performance on human trafficking. And one of the things it did was it started to cut the trafficking networks. The ability of people to get from other places, to pay people to get from somewhere else into Thailand as a route into you know, Malaysia and Indonesia and elsewhere. The consequence was that uh, boatload, I mean, first of all, um, you know, overland uh, trafficking was, was addressed, in, in, in part at least, um, but boat trafficking too became an issue. And as a result, the, the Thai government said to, to people arriving by boat, you're not welcome here, we're improving our performance so that we get a, a better result from the United States in the trafficking in persons report. As a result, uh, boatloads of Rohingya refugees leaving Myanmar, uh, leaving Myanmar desperate, um, couldn't land in Thailand, tried to land elsewhere. And they received the same answer in other places. Well, when they get to Malaysia, they're told, well, you should have gone to Thailand. A situation where they're sitting on a boat with very little food, very little water, something had to be done. And that's why we're seeing what we're seeing on the TV. Now, it stopped recently, not because the issues in Myanmar have changed, it stopped recently because, they're like here, uh, it's monsoon time. So it's, it's rainy season, the Bay of Bengal is, is, is not a safe place to be in a boat in rainy season. It's, uh, so, so the boats stop for, uh, stopped for the time being, but not the cause. The cause still exists. So, what's happening in terms of uh, Myanmar electorally? There's talk that there's a transition towards democracy. There's a, a second election in um, 2015, in, in 8, 8th of November. Um, I just skip through, it's not an image you necessarily want to be looking at for too long. Um, there's an, an election on the 8th of November uh, what's likely to happen out of, uh, out of this election? Well, what's happening in Myanmar currently is that um, uh, lots of the freedoms that we believe accompany democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of the two, have an uncensored media, have opened up avenues that were perhaps unintended. And one of the avenues that's been opened up is an avenue for people to say extremist things. And I don't want to dwell upon this because it's it's uh, you know a, 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 an area in and of its own. But you've no doubt seen on on uh, the television reports of uh, an increase in what they call Buddhist nationalism, but, but, but Buddhist chauvinism within <coughs> Myanmar. Uh, Time magazine ran a, a front a cover story uh, on uh, a, a politically active monk, uh, Uwaratu who um, has very strong views on, um, on Myanmar's uh, Muslims. I clipped this from his Facebook page yesterday. So that image uh, is, is from Waratu's Facebook page. Um, Waratu is incredibly active within Myanmar in terms of stirring up anti-Muslim feeling and anti-Rohingya feeling. What we've seen as a result is, is a mainstreaming of uh, a, uh, of extremist expression a and media freedoms have meant that people are able to do that. Uh, Waratu is connected with a, a group called the 969 movement which is an anti, I mean it claims to be a sort of a, a, a pro-Buddhist but it's in fact an anti-Muslim organisation and he's also closely connected 
with uh, a, a group called the Committee for the Protection of Nationality and Religion, the Mabata. Uh, and they are the organisers of anti-Muslim activity in Myanmar in a way, uh, in an organised way that hasn't been seen, I think, ever in that country. They have proposed uh, a uh, package of laws called the um, uh, Protection of Race and Religion Package, the four points that they want to propose to the parliament. Um, the first is actually law. It was made law, was signed into law the week the Thai government hosted a conference in Bangkok to address the issue of the Rohingya in the Bay of Bengal. That week, Myanmar's President Ten Sein signed into law the Population Control Healthcare Law. Put simply, it's a law that says if a community can't provide the resources or resources are stretched, then women shall not have children more than once every three years. Um, I've, written a, I've written a piece for the conversation which you can read for some more details um, about that. And there's some very good commentary uh, as well from um, you know, lots of other people. The UN have raised extreme concerns about what that law does, but that's law now in Myanmar. It's not a proposal, it's the law. The three other parts, um, which are the Religious Conversion Bill, which is about preventing people converting to religions, other, you know, preventing Buddhists from converting to another religion. Uh, the Myanmar Buddhist Women's Special Marriage Bill, which is uh, about making it difficult for people who are Buddhist, women who are Buddhist, to marry anyone who is not a Buddhist. And the Monogamy Bill. The monogamy bill does a couple of things. It outlaws uh, polygamy, which is seen as a, 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 a Muslim thing. Um, but in, in um, Southeast Asian societies, is, is by no means exclusively uh, Muslim, but is perceived to be. Uh, but it also says that if a couple is cohabiting in a, in a marriage-type relationship, then they should be married. And quite likely will be you know, this is a this is a new spin on the on the on the shotgun wedding. You know, this this is a shotgun wedding organised by the state. They're they're the they're the three proposals that are before the parliament currently. They are um, uh, awful in terms of restrictions on people's freedom, but they give you some sense of the direction of politics in Myanmar, where politics is going in Myanmar. That these things are not just in the parliament. They're not wacky proposals by outliers in the parliament. These are mainstream proposals. One of them is now law. Uh, in fairness to the National League for Democracy, who are quite likely to do exceptionally well at the election, and Aung San Suu Kyi is a member of parliament, uh, the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi did not support um, the first uh, proposal in the parliament on human rights grounds. But my concern is that these are problems in many ways of her making. She told Hillary Clinton in 2012, on the sense that she said, I, I want to be a politician, not an icon. And she's become a member of parliament. And she's a legislator. But she wants to win an election. And my, my view would be that she was silent for far too long on issues like the Rohingya. She, she's never made a very clear statement to say that they, certainly she's never made a statement to say they're entitled to citizenship. Um, but she's also, when she's asked about the Rohingya, she says, oh, well, yes, well, there was violence on both sides and we need to look after both groups. It's this equivocation that I think has emboldened people like Waratu and the Mabata. It's given license to these groups to know that, <coughs> I'm not calling it a dog whistle, by any stretch of the imagination. But it's, it's a sense that the opposition leader is turning a blind eye to their activities and it has emboldened them and it has given them the political space to organise in, in, in a way that I think a strong condemnation early on from Aung San Suu Kyi would have created a very different political situation in Myanmar as we approach an election. So it's now very dangerous for a politician in Myanmar to say that they support any policy that might be perceived to lead to increased rights for Muslim people or for Rohingya. But these are 
problems, I, I believe, in many ways of the opposition's making. And it's in that context that the election will take place. And for my mind, that's a very dangerous situation for, um, uh, well, for the future of Myanmar's democracy, for Muslims in Myanmar, and for um, the Rohingya in particular. So, um, what's next for the Rohingya and for Myanmar? Well, I think their future currently is pretty bleak. I think that they've been, in many ways, um, forgotten by the international community that wants to engage constructively with Myanmar to uh, embed its democracy uh, and embed liberal economic policies in Myanmar, um, maybe more so than they want to embed uh, a commitment to um, values such as um, basic human freedom and human rights. Uh, in my mind, the only long-term solution for the Rohingya that doesn't end with um, what the economist believes would be a, a, an ethnic cleansing or a genocide, and Penny Green, um, right, uh, the, the economist actually addressed some of Penny Green's work uh, on what's happening in Rakhine State and, this, and where it is in terms of steps towards genocide. So the only solution that doesn't lead towards that, in my mind, is the grant of citizenship to the Rohingya. Doesn't necessarily require changing what, what ethnic groups receive citizenship. It just requires the government of Myanmar to assess the citizenship claim of individual uh, Rohingya, but do it for the whole group, not just do it piecemeal. So do it for the one million Rohingya that are living in Rakhine State, who maybe maybe the government could find the way to consider them to be Arakanese Muslims, and maybe that would resolve some of the political tension, that, that individual people can feel that they are Rohingya, but in terms of what appears on their paperwork, perhaps they could be what, what maybe they used to be as a group, which was Arakanese Muslim. Now that's not looking likely. That's not looking likely by any uh, sense uh, of by any stretch. Um, th there's one very pertinent issue which involves uh, the election, which is that there's um, a, a there is currently a Rohingya member of parliament, uh, Sri Mong, not to be confused with Sri Man, the the absent speaker. He's a member of the, um, the ruling party. Because of course the Rohingya were given the right to vote in 2010, but it's been taken away since. Which gives you some idea of how flexible these things seem to be within Myanmar. He's sought to stand for re-election and been told that he's unable to do so because his parents, according to the government of Rakhine State, are not citizens of Myanmar, which means that he, as a Rohingya, is not a citizen of Myanmar. Now he's appealing that, but there's certain issues of um, where, where, you know, in terms of timelines of, of nomination, which leaves the possibility that there will be no Rohingya candidates or no one claiming to be a Rohingya uh, or having any sympathy for them at the election in those communities where one million Rohingya live highly likely that the outcome of the election is that um, a Rakhine or a Burman who may have very strong anti-Rohingya views or, or may not could well be the person that represents those communities in the parliament and that is a, a you know in terms of steps towards uh, steps towards genocide again a million people with no voice They've been put into one small area with no <coughs> voice in the administration of the country. And really worrying things. Um, I'll, I'll conclude with uh, something a little bit positive because it's it's not a it's not a particularly positive story. Um, I'll say this first: if you're looking for something you can do, um, MSF uh, is doing great work 
in Rakhine State. They're, they're basically, um, they're, they're <coughs> one of the few medical providers for Rohingya in Rakhine State. And they're back in, they were kicked out, and now they're back in again. And uh, they, they're there because the Rohingya can't access medical services elsewhere. So rather than taking the Rohingya to a medical service where they can't get permission to travel, MSF goes in. So if you're looking for something to do in the future in terms of making donations, I would say um, a good one would be MSF if you want to do something that would have, at some uh, sense, some, um, some support. Um, but th th there is something positive, it, it, it's this, it is that the international community is now to, in a sense, whether governments are doing something useful for the Rohingya, people have noticed the Rohingya. And um, five years ago, when I was doing uh, Rohingya research, there was very little interest, uh, certainly very little reporting, but very little interest in the community of what would happen. And there will be interest now in the United States in particular, and in terms of um, uh, political pressure on the government of Myanmar and and on Aung San Suu Kyi, um, it's um, likely to be that if there's pressure from the community on politicians that are engaged in terms of policy uh, within Myanmar, that's that's my hope. It's not a um, I don't have a great uh, wonderful. Um, solution, but that's my hope, and we are a a much further along the process than we were five years ago. People have actually noticed that there's a problem. People are concerned about the problem, and people are calling for a uh, calling for a solution. And uh, I just hope that we um, uh, we get a much more positive one because uh, everyone deserves. Um, to have their human rights respected. And for far too long, that hasn't been the case for Myanmar's Muslim Rohingya. And uh, I think it should be the case in the future. Thank you.